who gives me this. Derek, may I start? Good. Good. This is going to be the most important session you go to your whole time in Davos. I can't believe, I can't believe there are empty seats. Um, those people, those, those people are, are missing out. And, and I think the reason is pretty obvious. I mean, semiconductors drive everything we do. They're, they're in our phones. They're in our watches. They're certainly in our, our uh, cars and, and trucks. I, I just came from the a metaverse demonstration that Microsoft and Accenture are doing here. If any of you haven't seen it, I would recommend you go do it because it creates all sorts of possibilities for a very semiconductor intense uh, uh, future. So they, they've really increasingly, we uh, come to depend on them for life. Pat Gelsinger has talked about semiconductors as the new oil. Oil's still doing pretty well these days, but, <laughs> but, but, Conversations here at Davos are clearly about moving away from oil. We are not moving away from semiconductors. They will increase in importance over the course of the next decade uh, and the next two, two decades. And, of course, in the last couple of years, we've seen them play a much bigger role, a much more important role in geopolitics. But we've also seen, and, that, and this is where I want to start. I'll introduce the great panel uh, we have in a minute. We've also seen a crazy swing in supply and demand. Uh, we went through a year where everybody was talking about this intense shortage of semiconductors and you couldn't get the car you wanted because the automobile industry wasn't getting the semiconductors it needed. And now we're on the opposite side of that, uh, where there is a glut of semiconductors, too many, and prices are dropping by enormous percentages. And so I, where I'd like to start is how we got into this mess. We have the perfect panel to discuss all of this. Uh, I will introduce them, starting with Martin Lundstedt, who is uh, the CEO of Volvo, makes uh, high-end trucks with how many semiconductors in them now? Uh let, let everyone guess here. I remember in the start of this crisis, people asked me and media asked me, uh, what about the semiconductor in the semiconductor in your truck? <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the reality is that in a diesel propulsed uh, truck today, it's uh, around 1,750. 1,750. Uh, and on, now we are in serial production for battery electric uh, vehicles, as you know, both on semi uh, heavy but also on the heavy duty. There is between 3,500 and 4,000. So it's rather complex value chains, right? There, there you go. It will double yeah. soon. And then, in addition to that, but we'll talk about that later, the whole connectivity story with charging, etc. Yeah. Then uh, Lise J. Schreinemacher is the Minister of Trade in the Netherlands and, and has discovered her job is much more about semiconductors than she probably ever imagined. <laughs> Had anticipated. <laughs> yeah. And we also have uh, Ashwini uh, uh, Vaishna, who is the Minister of Railways, Communication, Electronics, IT. Anything else? <laughs> That's enough. Uh, 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 from God. <laughs> uh, for India and has uh, uh, big aspirations for expanding into the semiconductor business. And then uh, Pat Gelsinger, who is the CEO of Intel. And, and Pat, I'd like to start with you um, to explain how the heck this happened. How did we go from this huge shortage to this huge glut in such a short period of time? And doesn't that indicate some sort of a failure on the part of systems. Well, you know, overall, you know, as you've indicated, Alan, you know, the world is moving more digital, right? You know, every aspect of human existence becoming more uh, digital. You know, I call it the five superpowers. Everything's becoming connected. Everything is becoming a computer, right? We have infrastructure between cloud and edge that allows, you know, uh, you know, essentially everybody can own a supercomputer now in a few seconds, right? You know, you have AI, right, which is making sense of all this data, and finally we're able to sense everything as well, right? You know, see, hear, all of our you know, digital devices. So literally these superpowers are transforming every aspect of human existence. So you continue to see this demand. Obviously the semiconductor industry, a fixed cost, you know, long-term heavy capital industry. If I run a factory full, it costs me X. If I run it empty, it costs me X, <laughs> right? So how do you run them? Full, right? And COVID created this enormous disruption. Literally, semiconductors were six years, right, of shortages in the industry. Inventories building, everybody's struggling to catch up. You know, how do I finally, you know, get to it? And then all of a sudden, the economy changes. None of us forecasted, except for maybe Larry Summers, right? You know, this decline in the industry. And all of a sudden, you get hit twice. Yeah. Right, first declining demand, and then second declining inventory position 
over a six year cycle of building up. And all of a sudden now, you know, the industry turns. Now, semiconductor cyclicality is not unusual to the industry because of this long term fixed cost nature of the industry. So we have ups and downs. Gordon Moore you've used never to joke, had ups and downs like yeah. that before. <laughs> uh, hey, you know, right. You know, it's, it's not, you know, if you look over the history of the industry, we've had pretty radical cycles, you know, before Gordon Moore, one of our founders, right, Moore's Law, used to joke, we had we have supply demand balance exactly two moments in time, once on the way up, once on the way down, <laughs> right? And we're on the way down. Now that said, you know, everybody, you know, still believes the semiconductor industry doubles this decade. Yeah. Right. And when you think about that, you know, you still need to make these long term investments. And I you know, said, I feel like I'm managing. Right. I'm driving the car, hitting the brakes or driving the truck. Sorry, Martin. <laughs> right. You know, hitting the brakes and hitting the gas at the same time, yeah. because a three quarter economic cycle cannot dictate a five year capital cycle. Yeah. Right. So we have to keep making those long term investments, even as near term, we're struggling through inventories. And the final point is we still have we still have shortages on critical technologies. Wow. Right. Even as we have overall gluts, there's still pieces <clears throat> of the industry that I'm still on allocation for the next year. Isn't it nuts? So just before we move to Martin, so the glut will cause no reduction in your investment plans. Well, everybody needs to make some near term reductions, but my long term capital build outs for leadership and capacity stay steady as it goes. You know, and we have to stay yeah. on the gas, even as some of the capacity adjustments we need to make you know, to match the near term economic uh, cycle. But, you know, fundamentally, I got to keep all the strategic investments on track. So, Martin, you're trying to run a business. You're trying to make these trucks that have one thousand seven hundred. Mm. And I forgot the last two digits. I'm sorry, but <laughs> a lot of semiconductors <laughs> in them. How do you deal with this one? wild swing from shortage to glut. Yeah, but first and foremost, I think uh, we are, uh, to Pat's point also, of course, uh, used to cyclicality. I mean, uh, commercial vehicles, uh, logistics, transportation, uh, by nature is uh, cyclical, so, so that is built in in our business models. We are B2B, of course, side, so, so we have uh, strong relations uh, downstream also with our customers to understand uh, what is happening. Uh, we have more than one pound point. Uh, we have almost two million connected vehicles and machines around the globe that we're following constantly. Did you lose sales because of the shortage? Yeah, yeah, uh, everyone did. Uh, so we, we always said that it's an absolute game and it's a relative game. Uh, I mean, uh, but, but everyone, so we've had an undersupply uh, due to mainly semiconductors and electronics uh, during the last couple of years. Uh, but also other factors because we have seen big unbalances in, in the whole system. And I think it's coming from the fact that when we were sitting in, at the end of March 2020 in the group, and we are in 190 countries, uh, I mean, really global company. Of course, what do you do? You stop 85% of your global operations when it comes to f industrial footprint, right? Uh, you need to continue to serve your customers, uh, societal critical activities. Just, just make sure right? you close down 85% of your operations because you could not get the semiconductor. No, because COVID hit us. Oh, because COVID hit us, sorry. And what is happening then, end of March, 2020 say we need to preserve cash flow now we don't know we cannot broken supply chains directly you remember how it went uh, France and, and, and Italy closing down but also in the US etc then we try to define in phase stages what what sh how should we think about it? initial shock stop phase restart ramp up new normal I think we the, the five phases came, but they, they didn't come uh, with the timing and with the magnitude expected. Yeah. And that caused, of course, the, the, because the, the revamp was quicker, was faster more steep, and more brutal. And then some of the industries were even quicker than electronics, consumer, etc. And, and the transportation industry and, uh, uh, had these unbalances then, so to speak. And, and do you, before I go to Liz, Jay, so then do you, when you look at that, do you say, oh, that was like a once in a century happening and it's never going to happen again and so we don't have to change our business operations because of that? No, no. Okay. We have learned a lot. I mean, I, I think the main learning is not only for the, I mean, you can say, will it happen again, uh, COVID or whatever, but, but what we have learned together is that uh, uh, the value chain cooperation not at least also what we will talk about what we were talking about this week when it comes to the green transformation is about I mean connecting completely different for many other reasons as well not only with your tier one but really with the innovators in that specific value chain so I mean the, the relations that we have with uh, with the semiconductor uh, uh, innovation leaders today is of course around more transparent planning 
uh, longer, uh, long tra longer, long term, longer term, term uh, more transparent, say this is our latest view on it, uh, what do you think about it, uh, open up for different corridors in that. But even more importantly, regarding the technology roadmaps moving forward. So we know that we are comparing notes both from a competitive standpoint, innovation power, but also actually from capacity alignment, so we understand. Because I think what all of us have learned about semiconductors <laughs> last year <laughs> is yes. just yeah. amazing. I, 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 I've never been so popular. <laughs> <laughs> but it means much closer partnerships it, between it you and you but than ever in the past. Exactly, because, you know, and even just one of the little data points, you know, the average car is going from 4 to 5% of the bill of materials as semiconductors. By the end of the decade, it's expected to be 20% because of EV and AV. You know, that's a 4 to 5x increase in the role of semiconductors. You thought the last couple of years were bad? If we don't fix this supply chain yeah. and this innovation partnership, how do you ever deliver EV, AV, IVI, you know, these key transformational yeah. aspects to the it's industry? And, yeah. and it's not just in this yeah. industry, but it's frankly in every industry. Now, now Lee Jay, as a trade minister listening to this conversation, I, I would think my instinct would be, boy, that's chaos. I'm staying out of that. <laughs> why, why do you want to be involved in this? Well, as a politician, you, sh you can never be scared, so you always have to move forward when you see a challenge like this. Uh, but, well, as the Netherlands, you know, we are a small country, but a big player when it comes to uh, semiconductors. Yeah, and uh, uh, just to emphasize the importance of semiconductors with the challenges we are facing today, uh, when it comes to climate change, for example, we really need it for, to uh, the uh, sustainable transitions, but also for digitalization. So they are crucial for any and every aspect in our economies, but in our daily lives, well, you mentioned it, uh, telephones, everything. And so there are a few things that, as a trade minister, uh, I take into account. One is we should never be too dependent on one country or region when it comes to semiconductors and the raw materials. Which, and just to, just to stop there yeah. for a second, the world is right now. What is it, 92%? of semiconductors yeah. come from. And uh, uh, obviously we are seeing this happening. We have a CHIPS Act in the European Union. There's a CHIPS Act in uh, the US. Uh, but I think when it comes to, uh, to the chips industry, we really need to work together on this. So we have the TTC, for example, the, uh, the platform where we uh, engage in discussions about this, because it's not only about reshoring when it comes to the production of chips, but also the French shoring. I think we really need to see where are the shortages, but also well, where is the, uh, the advanced chips production, where is the mature chip production, and just to make sure that uh, we don't just uh, double down on everything, and then we have chips production, where is the mature chip production, and just to make sure that uh, we don't just uh, double down on everything, and then we have nothing. Well, but French join is a very different version of free trade than we talked about in these forums 10 years yeah. ago or 20 years ago. Yes, but so the world is changing. Yeah. Uh, but I don't think that uh, as a European Union or as the Netherlands, we can uh, do it just on a national, uh, a national way. So I think the third thing would really be to work together uh, on this. And not only the US and the EU, but also with Korea, with uh, uh, other countries in that region, and also uh, 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 with other countries that could f uh, serve as uh, uh, production locations. And uh, yeah. Yep. Good. Ashwini, you, you want in on this. <laughs> it, uh, India has a long-term plan to build up the uh, semiconductor business in your country. Why and what are you thinking? Three things. First is electronics manufacturing, which was practically negligible 10 years back, is today a significantly large industry, $87 billion. Um, this iPhone 14 that you see is made in India. The <coughs> supply chain is shifting to the country. Um, sector after sector, we are getting from import substitution to export-led growth. So telecom equipment, three years from now, India will be a large telecom equipment exporter. The, all the pieces are well set. Development is very good. A couple of companies have already ex started exporting to countries like U.S. So a very large market which requires semiconductor as the basic raw material, item one. Item two, a very competitive talent pool, good talent pool, about 52,000 semiconductor engineers working in the country. And almost all of them are working from legacy nodes to the cutting edge to the SOC, getting the uh, absolutely new optimization in 
power consumption, all kind of stuff. The latest and really some of the leading edge technologies our people are working, our talent is working. That as the second factor. Third factor, our university system, which is producing about 500,000 engineers every year, we have tailored our project, our, our entire plan, to make sure that this university system generates a significantly large number of talent. And we have committed to develop 85,000 talent over the next 10 years. And within the one year of our announcement of our policy, we announced the policy on 1st January of 2022. By now, we have already tied up with 60 universities. We have changed the course curriculum. So all these factors together make it very natural that India should Indeed. be the destination and, for semiconductor. And, and how about financing? How, uh, how much money is the government putting behind this effort? Government is putting $10 billion. Um, that is just the first tranche. And uh, we fully understand that this is not something which can be done in a quarter or a two or a year. This is a long haul. This will require a lot of persistence. This will require lots and lots of effort. And I thank friends like Pat who are guiding us in this journey. And we have listened to the industry when we announced the uh, scheme on 1st Jan 2022. Uh, Pat and many others gave us the inputs that the demand for higher nodes, which go into electric vehicles in Volvo, in the train sets, in practically all the telecom equipment, in power electronics, all those sectors require nodes which are higher nodes. So we changed our policy in October, huh. opened it up further. So very and no flexible. One, no one has said, no one in, in the Indian government has said, hey, wait a minute, why are we investing these billions of dollars in the middle of a glut? As uh, Pat very clearly said, this kind of ups and downs have been seen in this industry for quite some time. As uh, Volvo, what, 4,000 uh, semiconductors in a truck, in an EV, uh, in a train set, that number is close to 12,000. And in train set, we are, uh, we are right on track to become a major exporter in the coming three years. So the yeah. demand is going to be huge. You're so, not worried about that. You have no, no doubt about absolutely the, not. the yeah. demand. The, the super mind, you know, right. You know, this will take time was one of the funny <laughs> comments. You know, it took us three decades to have our supply chains move off of U.S. and U EU. Right. There were very active industrial. Which policies. all of you, by the way, are saying was a big mistake. Well, to the extreme that we allowed it to occur. Hey, the fact that some of this was put in place, you know, right. You know, some of the trade decisions as well, three decades ago. Hey, you know, we can all second guess those policies now as we're looking back on it. But the fact that over three decades, we allowed our industry to go from 80 percent U.S. and Europe to 80 percent in Asia and become precariously, you know, dependent on very few places in the world. Right. You know, to me, that is the core issue that we're out to but, fix. But how, I, I have to ask you, I have and to ask it will take decades to fix. It will take some time. We're uh, uh, 20 minutes into this conversation. No one has mentioned the word China, uh, but clearly. Yeah, I do. That's why I'm here. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm here for that. I, China has, is clearly part of what's changed in this equation. Can you talk about that? Well, you know, overall, you know, I mean, they have, you know, you know China, Korea, Taiwan, you know, Japan, you know, they have been driving their industrial policies in this area. That's why the industry has moved. Right. You're right. To Asia. At but, this at, point. but at one, and at been one point, very, we thought that was OK. Right. Yeah. And, you know, we're now seven, I think, it's seven to five year p plans that China's put in place that have prioritized this industry. Sort of obvious. Right. So, I mean, this is a long, you know, investment cycle on their part. You know, they are the largest, you know, manu you know manufacturer now uh, outside of Taiwan. Right. Is China. Right. And, you know, they process most of the equipment through China. This has become a huge piece, right? And, you know, there is nothing like disengagement ever possible in the economy because they play a huge role. But at the same time, we're also saying, what is the geographically balanced supply chain need to look like for the world? Europe should be able to say, I can meet my critical industry requirements. So should the Americas. That's what we're out to do is not, you know, not separation, right? Not disengagement, but a balanced, resilient supply chain. And that to me is the singular word we should all be focused on. If I could rename WEF this year, it'd be resilience, not dis not fragmentation. So you're not taking my bait. It's not China Absolutely specific. Not. Absolutely not. <clears throat> No, no, but, but, but I think, I mean, yeah, just to add to what you say, I mean, we are uh, running businesses. We are used to think about the P&L, the cash flow, and how we translate the cash flow into uh, utilizing it, either to dividend it out or to actually uh, build up our balance sheet, right? 
and how should the balance sheet look like? And I think Europe and uh, US have not spent from uh, a country perspective or from a region perspective enough time on thinking through the strategic pieces of their balance sheet. So it's not about protectionism, it's like a, a, a company. What should I partner up with? What should I do and uh, understand when it comes to technology innovation? Uh, this we have not been doing when it comes to the critical. Take a very practical example. Now that's also related to semiconductors. 5G rollout. And then we say oh, we need to have examples of business cases and auctions and bandwidth and blah, blah, blah. When the reality is that the rollout of 5G is a platform for imagination, a platform for innovation, that is a balance sheet piece for future infrastructure. And that is what we need to think about when we think about the critical components of uh, value chains in order to be competitive in innovation in all aspects. Not, so I understand, I, I think the minister had a very good point when you're talking about what are the critical aspects in the Indian balance sheet. And this is one of those, together with the talent. But, yeah. It's not more difficult than that in reality. And we need to think through what are these critical pieces for the European or North American I'd balance sheet. I'd like to add one more point here. <laughs> it took 60 years for the semiconductor industry to grow to $550, $600 billion. It's going to be $1 trillion in the next six years. So that's the kind of growth which is happening in this going to double in six years. Yeah. By so, the end of 2030, one trillion we cross is the expectation of both analysts at this point. So there's mm. enough for everybody. <laughs> Are you yeah. confident? Well, Netherlands I... is small. <laughs> <laughs> well, we need, do need a lot of chips. <laughs> um, but can I throw another, uh, well, red meat, piece of red meat sure, in the I, arena? Sure, red meat. Um, and it's because I'm now also here with businesses, and that is one of the, the, we are talking about supply and demand, but I think that when it comes to supply, one of the critical issues will be raw materials and the critical raw materials and where do we get them because we are talking about now production locations uh, but also just uh, the the lithium that we need for our batteries and uh, other materials that we need for our semiconductors and where do we well I'm sitting next to someone from Sweden so uh, maybe uh, you're, you're going to solve you, it on the ocean floor yeah, uh, <laughs> you stumbled upon some uh, critical raw materials uh, I believe Absolutely. <laughs> I, I was actually up with the commission on Friday okay. uh, looking at the mine there so well look and so I think that is also something that uh, I want to ask businesses how, how do they see the role of governments because businesses will have to identify which one uh, we are uh, working on a raw materials act in the European Union we have done it nationally in the Netherlands and and uh, where do you see a role of governments yeah. uh, well, in this? Well, Pat, I'll bet because, you spend most yeah. of your time these days with government officials. Uh, yeah. give, me, give me an estimate. Well, you know, a fair amount, right, in getting U.S. and EU Chips Act done, been very active. But I'd also, you know, uh, you know, have us, you know, make sure we think about supply chains, not about any one topic. Right, because even there, you know, the minerals are not the issue in most cases. It's actually the refining of the minerals, right, and where that is. It's actually moved, easy, fairly easy to move the minerals, the refineries, right, and obviously U.S. are regulatories around environmental and so on. Hey, maybe we're not going to fix it. It's the fixing the supply chains that come into it, right, you know, and as we look at where semiconductors are built now, hey, you know, it's also the packaging assembly test. It's also then the systems and the, you know, uh, you know sheet metal bending that goes in and where the power supply is built, the displays, the LCDs and so on. Uh, has to be across the supply chain. And my advice to government is make sure we're looking across the supply chain and fixing one by one every one of the critical factors that give you the assurance of supply that you need for your critical industries over the long term. No, and not just at one not point. Not just one thing. And, yeah. Um, okay. Thank you. So another piece would be uh, green manufacturing. Uh, semiconductor manufacturing will become... Uh, uh, will also be affected by the green discourse we have everywhere. So we in India are very clear that whatever new plants, new fabs that we uh, set up will be served with green energy, will be serviced by green energy. We already have 42% of our energy uh, from green sources, from renewable sources, and we do want to uh, add that advantage to the semiconductor manufacturing yep. also. No, but I think what is linked to the experience we've had now with the semiconductor crisis is the, uh, Andrea, who is our chief uh, procurement officer, she said, uh, I've changed title now, it's uh, chief uh, partnership officer, chief partnership officer, CPO. Uh, no, because the reality is that, to, to, to Minister's point here, 
we are of course going to the source both of the innovation power and the capacity power for, for sustainable solutions. So, I mean, we are partnering up with the mining companies together and thereby also pooling our tier one and tier twos to, to work together with both us because we cannot do it alone. And that the power of scope three also in the green transition will be fabulous here because I mean what is my scope three is someone else's scope one or two. Yeah. <clears throat> so, so also what we learn now going from spot market to long term agreements both on innovation, technical roadmaps and capacity, um, innovating together, not as OEMs uh, handing over the RFQ, the request for quotation, <laughs> transactional business, answer this. Don't come up with any own ideas, please. Yeah. Give me a low price. Into saying, we need your help. We, we need, need your innovation. Yeah. We need your fantasy and imagination. This is, this a, is a big I, shift. This, and I want to open the conversation up a little bit to the audience. I mean, this is a huge change in the way we talk about globalization. I've been involved in these conversations for, I don't know, 45 years. And, and uh, we have, by the way, we have Governor uh, Gretchen Whitmer from uh, Michigan here. I'm going to make you speak for the United States in, in a minute. I may, I may get Senator Portman in on yeah, it, Yeah, we too. also have Senator Cantwell behind you there as well. Oh, good. We've got the, we, could, we have a quorum. Uh, 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 I, I, I'm sorry. So many of you are behind me. I, 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 I can't see, but I, but I really do want to open it up because I've been in these conversations for 45 years, and for most of that time, it was the United States attacking other countries for subsidizing critical industries. And if you, if you mentioned, you know, industrial policy, uh, whether it was Japan or Europe or China, the, the political responses in the U.S. was we're not going to get our hands dirty. We're not going to pick winners and losers. We're not going to subsidize. And now all of a sudden you come to Davos and we have the CHIPS Act, massive subsidies for chip production in the United States. Competitive uh, investments. Excuse me. Massive competitive investments in the United <laughs> States. Uh, uh, there's been more talk about the badly named Inflation Reduction Act over the last three days than there was in the U.S. at the time uh, uh, and the subsidies. It, it, are you sure we're doing the right thing? This is a huge lurch from the historic position of the U.S. government. Yes. That I'll expand. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, you know, I think it's important to remember that this industry largely began in the United States, and it didn't just get up and leave. It was lured, and it was courted, and it was incentivized. And I've heard so many people here say, we're so glad the United States is back in the game and committed to – um, climate action and also criticism that you know these incentives are, are 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 unhelpful to other countries. But as you think about what is happening around the globe, it is healthy for all of the world that the United States is um, active, is producing chips. Think about one of our incumbent businesses, General Motors. They buy chips from around the world. They need to have chips in the United States as well. These are global issues. It is a national security issue, and I know Senators Cantwell or Portman can, will add, I'm sure, if, if called upon. But I can also tell you from the local perspective, it's about good jobs as well in Michigan. We're really proud of our auto industry that is moving fast and transitioning quickly. We're also proud to have for a long time been a provider of some of the purest polysilicon in, in the world at Hemlock Semiconductor. We've been doing a lot of this work. Now that the world knows why it's so important, we're excited about what the so opportunities are. So no second ahead. thoughts? Not, not from I, my I, perspective. I want to put Senator Portman on the spot because you've been involved in these conversations as long as I have. <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, you, you have have been a, a staunch defender of free trade when, when it meant something different than uh, it, it means when Lee's just said it. So, so uh, w w how do you view what's happening here? I noticed earlier when Pat was talking about trade agreements, he pointed at me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. No, I mean, I, look, I, I, I have a little different view. I, I think it's about balanced trade, and it's about free trade, but fair trade. And so you're right, there's no free market in semiconductors. Uh, unfortunately, and, and that has been true. Probably never has been. And I was about to say that that has been true since the start, I'm sure. But if you look at the subsidies that other countries have provided, uh, and you look at what happened during the pandemic when we all became more keenly aware of the supply chain issues, you mentioned uh, resiliency, I would say uh, reliability as a national security matter and an economic security matter, all came to the fore. I mean, here you, you had cars on lots in Ohio, you know, just waiting for their semiconductor. And, uh, you know, we have a lot of semiconductors in our military. And you mentioned, Alan, that 90% of the high-end semiconductors that are used in things like F-35s are made in one country. 
where there's a lot of vulnerabilities right now. So I think it's a national security issue, economic security issue, but a recognition that although we might all like to have a free market in some of these essential products like semiconductors, it does not exist, exist, and it didn't. And so that's why we need to do things. One other thing quickly that has been missed in the CHIPS Act, a lot of this is not about specific subsidies to specific companies. It's about research, and it's about fundamental research. And Maria can talk more about this than anybody because she was very involved in this over time, but like the National Science Foundation funding, which is critically important for our future in terms of the – investments in basic science that the United States is now making. Yeah. And just if I could, right. Yeah, go ahead. These are two of the heroes of getting the CHIPS Act done. You know, Senator Cantwell and Senator Portman, you know, huge to get it across the line because any major piece of legislation, yeah. hard to get done. And these are two of the people do, that made do it happen. You, it's Senator Cantwell, heroes. do you want to continue the love fest? <laughs> <laughs> I would just say I think there's three big issues here that I don't know that we're honing in on. And the first one is how incredibly expensive it is to build fabrication facilities. So when you look at the issue that chips have now become an essential component in the information age of just about everything, uh, you have to ask yourself, I mean, would we do the same thing for 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 a bread shortage, you know, for for wheat or something of that nature? So it has become that essential in our day to day lives. So when the shortage is in the demand, people start saying, well, how are these companies going to fund these 20 billion dollar facilities in various places? And so I think that made the allure of helping to make it cheaper. So now you also have a pandemic, which brings home the point of if you can't get this supply, what does it mean? And certainly what does it mean to uh, national security? Yeah. And it all of a sudden, so I think what you've all discussed is there is now going to be for the future enough demand that we all can get in the game. And that is what we're going to uh, obviously reap the benefits from an automobile industry that basically can have the kind of driverless cars but is going to take an immense capacity Absolutely. so so really we are all we will rob portman will, and, and i and many other people will come back to this issue about the trade angle on this but at this moment, it's an essential, critical element to every single economy. We don't have enough production, and we all are going to figure out how to help this production for the future. Yeah. So uh, uh, we don't have anyone sitting on this stage from Taiwan, Korea, China. There may be some people behind me, but I don't have eyes in the back <laughs> of my head. If there's somebody back there who wants to take the microphone and... Uh, Taiwan? <laughs> uh, um, but, but you're talking about a major shift. I, I, is there anyone else who wants to get in on this conversation? Yes, go ahead. Oh, completely separate topic, you say. You're not going to take my bait. You're... That's all right. I'm used to people answering questions other than the one I ask. <laughs> tips and that we need to diversify and, and, and there's that challenge but uh, it's also, I mean, look, we need to look at the supply chain as a whole and identify the bottlenecks and solve them. We didn't really talk about mature tips. Now, that's mm -hmm. a massive issue there. You started out saying we're still on allocation in, in a lot of those areas. How do we address the challenges of the mature tips which are portable industrial goods for medical equipment? Some of those are life saving life and death. Uh, I would say that's a very critical issue. Um, it would be interesting to your perspective. Yeah, and may maybe just a quick view of this, right? In some cases, it's easier to redesign the chip to a more modern node than it is to build a four-year factory investment to build a process technology that is already 20 years old, right? The economics of making new capital investments in very old nodes, right, is a very difficult thing. So we've worked with a lot of customers to help them accelerate move to more modern nodes, right? And by the way, as, as you do that, it actually frees up more of the old capacity for some of those chips that are much harder to move uh, as well. But this is where I say deep conversations with the customers in the supply chain. And, you know, we're putting now in place, you know, multi-decade supply agreements with our customers, right? Saying, how do we take care of you for decades to come? Because this is such a harrowing experience. Yeah. You know, the fact that for, you know, literally for two $2 components, we're stopping billion-dollar projects, 
how untenable Crazy. that is for the global Crazy. economy. And you, I assume you're using both. You're using high uh, and low. Absolutely. And, and uh, to, to Pat's point also during this crisis, that's been both about, so to speak, working closer together on finding the right type of capacity short term, but also to redesign a lot. So we have spent uh, a lot of hours understanding how can we redesign and move this uh, short term, but more importantly, long term. And again, understanding where is the landscape moving. So if we look at the uh, American ship act that we are equally big, I mean, in, in US as we are in, 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 in Europe, 20% uh, of the ship act there is dedicated to the mature ships, right? Yeah. Yeah. Which is an important point. In Europe, it's, everything is dedicated to uh, the advanced ships, okay. which is a risk, by the way, because for uh, automotive and industrial sectors, uh, less than... 5% of all the ships that are used are actually the advanced nodes. And so, so we need to understand that constitution. It's both a capacity game, right, and an innovation game. And we need to cope with both. But, but again, it comes to understanding and how should we actually utilize the technology as it is for, for these different verticals, right? We have actually addressed that in our policy. Uh, that's a very valid point. Uh, close to half the total demand is from the mature nodes. So, exactly. Uh, so in our case, in, ca in the case of India, our entire policy supports mature nodes as well as advanced. We think we'll start with the mature nodes. And there's another innovation which is happening and which is where the design capabilities really come to play in, as Pat said. Um, for example, in a car, if there are like uh, 200 uh, chips going in, wouldn't it be more economical to design a system which has probably three or four chips, which is able to make sure that the... Uh, glass goes up and down uh, on time, make sure that the speed governor is properly in place. So that kind of innovation is also going to come back. If Absolutely. You fully agree. Yeah. Yeah. There's you know, definitely agree. a re-architecting now yeah. because a lot of what happened in the automotive industry, but also some of the other industrial industries, you know, they're tier one, tier two, tier three, tier four suppliers. They didn't even know what chips were in there. Mm. And all of a sudden, it's sort of like, what do you mean mm. we don't have semiconductor supply? But they didn't even have visibility through the supply chain because it had been sedimented, right, you know, through these uh, sub-suppliers as well. And that's where, you know, the intimacy of understanding the criticality of supply. I believe, you know, governments need to do that and supply chains, but also, right, customers need to do it, right? You know, because, you know, if you don't know where those core technologies are, how do you actually form policies to manage them? And that is where new kind of uh, innovations which come. For example, I wouldn't be surprised if in three years from now we see a car operating system automobile operating system, which basically makes sure that all the chips manufactured by different people for different functions, they are basically able to speak to each other in a very seamless way. So those kind of innovations are also part of the semiconductor. We're doing that. Um, yeah, I, I, I should say that we are already in there. And, and for the more advanced nodes when it comes to battery and fuel cell electric, but also when it comes to the autonomous verticals, right, on, on the commercial side. But, but having said that, I think it's also good to make a white book. Was it really a shortage? Or was all the ships allocated in the wrong places also? Uh, because I've, we have seen so many inventories sitting around. Coming back to Ohio, a lot of uh, cars or trucks or equipment, wherever, sitting on parking places with a lot of ships into them. So, so that is another uh, important uh, issue to address. More transparency will give also better options to really redistribute. Yeah, how, how do you fix that problem? Because if you have more uh, distributed production... Yeah. Planning becomes more complicated, not simpler. So how do you fix the fact, how do you make sure that people are making what you need? Let me start to share what you know yourself or what, uh, or what, what are your views. Again, we are not utilizing uh, the technology exists, I mean, uh, the platform economy to really make sure that everyone, to Pat's point, in the value chain is actually sharing the same type of information. It's a whispering game. And with and so the whispering you, game, the it... tail is getting, you know, bigger and bigger. And at the end of the day, so... Uh, how, how do you make it transparent? Share the information. Just, I mean, uh, as, as we do, think, we share on LinkedIn, we share everything and everyone can read it. So we can share with a number of T1 suppliers. Or and, and you might suppliers. recall, the first thing that Commerce did, was right, in the, the, the chip tax, was in fact supply chain transparency. Yeah. Right, where they, you know, started to put policies in place to start getting those things available, right, you know, so that people could start looking at it. I'd also say this to me is a little bit where fair mark, you know, free market kind of behavior, you know, distribution channels are generally pretty efficient, right, at that, uh, at that level. And, you know, you know, it's an area where, hey, a little bit of transparency. But the other factor is, and this is where I see a lot of this going in the future, is we're moving from 
chips to chiplets and composites where we need to drive more standardization, exactly. right? And the standardization of how the things are put together, how we can go from, you know, thousands of chips to hundreds of chips, right, you know, that have standardized interfaces in it, more interplay between the different components. You know, I expect there'll be some meaningful announcements in this area specifically for the auto industry this year. Mm. We are just about out of time. I want to go around the, the panel one last time and, and, and ask you, what's the one thing that people are missing in this very intense debate? What's, what's the one thing that you would like people to uh, sort of take away from this session to remember about what's going on? No, I think it's a lot of things, but uh, mainly that this is here to stay the growth of, I mean, uh, uh, semiconductors related to everything that will be digitalized in order to really deliver what we want to do for the planet, yeah. for society, to be competitive, etc. in our d different verticals. And therefore, uh, I think we should look strategically upon that, both from a company perspective, country perspective, and really work together to utilize the innovation power into this. Please. <laughs> well, you said, it, you said it very well. And um, uh, I believe that many things uh, were mentioned that are very important. I think that uh, um, the, the, the dependencies on one region, one country, uh, should really uh, be minimized. Uh, and I think that the transparency of value change, when it comes to value change shocks and uh, encountering them is really important and also for governments to step up and, and, and uh, help companies or allow companies to, uh, to uh, trade with different countries to make sure that uh, that they keep access to raw materials but also different parts of the value chain. Ashwin. I think trusted long-term partnerships would be a very important factor in success mm -hmm. going forward uh, in terms of supply chain uh, resilience, in, in terms of innovations in products that we bring in, in terms of uh, what do you do when uh, things go wrong in some part of the world, can you really rely? So in those things, uh, in all those matters, trusted long-term uh, agreements would be very, very critical. I think collaboration is the theme of this year's Davos. You got it right this time. Way to go, Derek. Yeah, that's <laughs> go ahead, Pat. <laughs> you know, right. The, the the famous statement: democracy does the right thing always after it's exhausted all other possibilities. <laughs> right. And you know, here we needed a global crisis to realize that we had allowed ourselves to become acutely dependent on single points of failure in the supply chain, on critical aspects that's underlying all aspects of humanity. You know, the simple word is, you know, we need resilient supply chains for the future without single points of failure. You know, that's what we need to be building and that's the core lesson that we need to have taken through, right, this economic, technological supply chain shock that we've gone through. Great. Pat, Ashwini, Liz J. Martin, thank you so much. Thank the rest of you for participating.